Uh, Bovada, good morning, hello. Uh, very pleased to be uh, invited to speak to you uh, today. Um, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm a geologist, that's my particular ology, but I'm a geologist who's uh, um, gained a, a particular um, interest and insight into your realm, if I'm, if I'm addressing archaeologists generally, um, and indeed with some of you in person, uh, both in the classroom, as it were, and in the field. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is giving a little bit of a, a deep time introduction to the landscape that we find ourselves in today. I am uh, the Geopark Officer um, for Forest Val UNESCO Global Geopark. It's one of a couple of UNESCO landscapes within the National Park. The other one is the World Heritage Site, of course, at uh, Blind Avon. And my role is, well, to talk to the public in its various guises, uh, the public sometimes being visitors, residents, uh, tourism businesses in particular, because the Geopark, if anything, is an economic designation which seeks to make something of the area's heritage for the benefit of sustainable tourism. And we can talk about what sustainable means on another occasion. Um, so I get paid to do that, and uh, it, you know, it's, it's a great job. Sometimes I have an excuse to be outside, uh, ideally on the sunny days. We've chosen a wet day today, great time to be indoors uh, speaking to you. So, I'm going to take you on a journey. I've titled the talk, Every Rock is on a Journey, uh, whether those rocks be planetary size or the size of grains of sand or silt. So it's one way of looking at the uh, deep history and the evolution of the landscape of the geopark. And I think that uh, it, some of the specifics will be different, but in general terms, it's also an introduction to the wider national park and indeed uh, areas uh, surrounding, not the whole of Powys, uh, but uh, you know, many of the surrounding areas. Let's see if I can uh, make these buttons work. I can. There we are. So those of you who are not familiar with the geopark, it's the western half, or if we're going to be really picky, the western 62% of the Brecon Beacons National Park. Uh, if you take a journey on the Brecon Mountain Railway and then continue on foot over the Gap Road uh, to the vicinity of Brecon, you're defining the eastern boundary. The other three boundaries, north, south and west, are identical with those of the National Park. So it's that area I'm going to focus on, but I'm going to bring examples into the talk from elsewhere, from the east of the National Park, and one or two that from just without, out, outside of the boundary. I'm a geologist. I'm bound to talk about rocks. And I, if, if talking to a general audience, to a non an audience consisting not of geologists, then one often wonders exactly where to start. I'll often present a map with lots of colours on, and I'll say, well, you don't need to focus too much on the detail. It's the general message that I want to get across is that there are a lot of different rocks, a lot of different landscapes, and through that, many other things that differ from one part of the geopark to another, depending on what is underneath your feet. And if the geopark is, 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 it does anything, it's connecting up the different ologies, it's making the links, searching for the links between geology, archaeology, industrial archaeology in particular along the southern fringe, uh, we can make links with mythology, of course, with ornithology, uh, zoology, speleology, caves are, are a significant part, botanology, no, that's not a term, is it? <laughs> but the botanists know what I mean. So lots of links to be made, and sometimes the excitement is trying to find the most obscure links. Let's see how, how obscure some of these might be today. Uh, in very brief terms, the northwestern part of the geopark, and hence of the national park, uh, is built upon the oldest rocks. These are rocks from the uh, Silurian and Ordovician periods. Uh, the very names themselves are Welsh in origin, names that are used around the world, the Silores tribe, with whom you'll be very familiar, and the Ordoviches. Geologists adopted those names and brought them into, into geological parlance. The Devonian, which is more or less equivalent to the Old Red Sandstone in these parts, uh, occupying the bulk of the uh, park, and then along our southern fringe, uh, we have the Carboniferous sequence uh, taking us down into the coal field to the south, but that's somebody else's story. Now, every rock is on a journey, but what sort of, what sort of journeys do rocks go on? Well, there are the big journeys, 
travelling long distances over a long period of time. And we're talking essentially about plate tectonics. And involved with plate tectonics, as, as the Earth's continental plates edge against one another, as they split apart, as they collide, we have orogenies. What a wonderful word. It's another word for a mountain building event. And so I'll make mention of those. And asso associated with an orogeny are thrust faults and folding and so forth. Metamorphism in some places, though we don't have any of that within this area. We have rocks going on journeys courtesy of water, whether in its liquid form or indeed in its frozen form. And again, a lot to see in the local landscape, courtesy of the action of rivers and glaciers. Uh, we will see mass movement. So this is bodies of material that are moving on mass, usually through the under the influence of gravity. These might be catastrophic landslides, it might be a slow affair. Again, I'll touch on one or two of those. There are cultural reasons, and this is broadly, I'm talking about archaeology here, about your domain. Um, rocks have been moved from one place to another at our hands, at the hands of our ancestors. I won't go into that in great detail because other people can talk about that aspect uh, with rather more uh, authority than I can. Mythology, what do I mean? We'll come back to that one. Mineral exploitation, we've certainly moved an awful lot of rocks out of holes in the ground and put them elsewhere, put them to different uses. And indeed, we've moved rocks in terms of construction of roads and so forth uh, in the civil engineering profession. And then cultural reasons too. Rocks get moved around the place today for various reasons, one of which could be broadly labelled recreation. So let's go back to plate tectonics and orogenies. And if we go back to the um, start of the Ordovician period, 470, 480 million years ago, um, we always reckon the oldest rocks in the, in the National Park and in the Geopark were about 470 million years old. Easy to remember because it's the same number as the main north-south route through the National Park. But that's a, a map of the world or a part of the world back at the beginning of the Ordovician. There's the equator near the top. And you can see right in the middle of the screen, two little green blobs, Scotland and the north of Ireland, not Northern Ireland, the north of Ireland. And right down at the bottom, you can see Wales, England, and the south of Ireland. And there's a great ocean between, the Iapetus Ocean. So the geography that we learnt at school, uh, if we apply it 470, 480 million years ago, it's a little bit different. We have to rearrange the maps. Uh, the inset uh, top uh, left just shows where rocks of this age, or division age rocks, are found within Britain. A whole swathe of them through Wales, not least through, uh, and hence the re one of the reasons why or division or divicas, that, that association has been made in geological circles. And we don't have to go all that far. Uh, we're going across into uh, Dovid Archaeological Trust's area to Gowan Goch, uh, it's a National Park Authority. Uh, owned and managed site. Uh, hardly need to say a great deal about the archaeology, except in terms of there being two uh, wonderful hill forts, a guy Vach and a guy Vau over there. Those hill forts are constructed, they were constructed by our ancestors, presumably the Silores, from Ordovician rocks, confusingly, uh, rock that was lying around the site, and rock that was lying there because of two things that had happened. The original uh, Feierwach grits, that's the name for these very hard and old sandstones, were folded uh, into a, 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 what's called an anticline, an upward fold, and in the process were split. And then came along the Ice Age much, much later and um, exploited the fractures in the rocks and left an awful lot of building material on site ready for our ancestors to do their best with. So uh, quite a place to visit if you're interested in um, archaeology, of course, if you're interested in geology, the ornithologists enjoy the site. Again, we can, we can go on. Lots of links to be made. Little inset there is uh, our ancestors' use of some of the Feierwach grits, these Ordovician age rocks, uh, for the construction of one of the portals on the southeast side of the big fort. We fast forward in time around about 40 or 50 million years into the middle of the Silurian period and the Earth's geography has changed a little bit. That ocean that uh, lay between uh, the north of future Britain and the south of future Britain is closing up and it does that throughout the Silurian period. This is the Iapetus Ocean, a forerunner 
if you like, of the Atlantic. So different geographies. And uh, some islands off to the south of us, Iberica, Armorica, Brittany, parts of Spain and Portugal, they'll play their part uh, in many tens of millions of years to come. Again, Silurian map, uh, the inset on the right shows that in the southern uplands of Scotland, parts of the Lake District and much of Wales, a lot of rocks of this age. And if we want to take a look at them, um, they're a little bit more shy and retiring for the most part than the Ordovician rocks. Um, but if we were to visit the uh, gorge of the Salva uh, and visit this particular little quarry, Quaglas, just off the uh, Hlangadok uh, Brunamen Road, then we would see a rippled bed of sandstone, but tilted up at about 70 degrees to the horizontal. And that reflects the origin of these sandstones uh, in marine conditions, but uh, which have subsequently been, uh, they've moved north, courtesy of, of continental drift of plate tectonics. They've moved upwards for similar reasons. They've been thrust upwards, and they've also been folded and tilted uh, so that we get their present disposition. It's rather more overgrown if you were to visit that site now. And then we can fast forward again into the next period, which is the Devonian period. Obviously, southwest, southwest England has a claim to the name of this one. And uh, by this stage, the Iapetus Ocean has been squeezed out of existence. Uh, Scotland, future Scotland, had been moving north, but we'd been moving north more quickly, and we collided. A great range of mountains was formed where that ocean had once been. We call them the Caledonian Mountains, because evidence for them comes from uh, Scotland, and the present-day mountains of, 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 indeed, the Scottish Highlands, the Lake District, Snowdonia, and then up into uh, Norway and into the Appalachians. Remember, there was no Atlantic back then. These are generally the roots of those mountains. And the Caledonian mountains were at least alpine, possibly Himalayan size. Um, so you're quite, a, quite an impressive range. Um, but we were welded uh, to Scotland and Northern Ireland, and we have been uh, ever since. That collision, which began in the Silurian, um, it came to a climax during the Devonian period, and I think this is slightly, is that a slightly misty slide? It is up on Munnoth Mithvai, so it's entirely feasible. Um, yes, that collision uh, climaxed at that period, and at times we don't have rocks, uh, any, any rocks that uh, are left to us as a legacy because erosion was taking place rather than deposition. So we have a, a, a lower old red sandstone, the early part of the Devonian, and we have an upper old red sandstone, the later part of the Devonian, but the middle Devonian appears to be missing. In the lower Devonian, and right at the boundary with the Silurian, we have a particular band called the Tilestones, with a capital T, and they contain mica. And the mica, being a very platy mineral, has the effect of making these rocks um, splittable into reasonably thin flags, and of course they were used, as the name would suggest, for tiles, at least before the coming of the railways and the, um, the, the rather finer quality roofing material, to be frank about it, uh, from Snowdonia, from Clamberis and Dinorowick and Festiniog. But um, the Long Quarry, as it's known, and, and another old, an old name for the um, Tilestones formation was the Long Quarry Formation. It actually cuts uh, part of the Roman marching camps, as, as you'll be aware, uh, upon uh, Munnethbach to Castell. The Old Red Sandstone is old. It's only 10% of the edge of the Earth, but in our terms, it's pretty old, 400, 450 million years old. Uh, it's not red. I've never seen any red sandstone. It's brown, shades of grey and green. Um, most of it actually isn't even sandstone. A lot of it is mudstone. But, you know, what's in a name? Got to call it something. Uh, the bits that are sandstone tend to show up as positive features in the landscape. So the, the high peaks are very much sandstone. But uh, down here, and certainly where we are in Brecon, we're talking about uh, mudstones, the Raglan mudstone, as it's known. And up on uh, Penna Creek, uh, well, I think this particular, the main shot was taken from, there's, a, there's a, an inset there, an aerial photograph of Penna Creek. We're talking about the Raglan mudstones. If we go over to the west, we can actually see the break between the lower old red sandstone, topped off here by the brownstones formation, and the upper old red sandstone, 
which I've labeled the Penavan Formation, but you may know it as the Plateau Beds. These things are always in, in the throes of change. Geologists like to rename things to confuse, well, themselves, um, as, well as, the, as well as the wider public. But there is a, a slight angular unconformity between the two. So the lower beds were deposited in the early Devonian. They were tilted ever so slightly by the ongoing orogeny, this mountain building event caused by this continental collision. And then the Penavan formation was laid on top. So there's about a one degree difference. And looking along the uh, escarpment from above uh, Hunavan Vach, you can just make that out. The plateau beds, the Penavan formation, also occurs at Penavan and Corn D, and it's a particularly hard-wearing sandstone. So it's protected the rocks below uh, from erosion uh, quite effectively. We'll move through now into the Carboniferous period, the next geological period represented in the area. Carboniferous coal bearing, that's where the name comes from. We have moved, um, so we're sat pretty much on the equator for most of the Carboniferous period, and that dictates the sort of conditions, the environmental conditions in which our, uh, which sediments were laid down and which have been bequeathed to us as a, as a, a very interesting range of rocks uh, and, and indeed an economically valuable uh, suite of rocks. If you were to walk the Beacons Way, um, then mostly you'll be walking on the Devonian Old Red Sandstone, but by the time you got to Herbert's Quarry, Black Mountain Quarries in the west, you'd be walking right through the middle of this picture and you're walking on a carboniferous seafloor, a tropical seafloor, and there is evidence of corals uh, beneath your feet. Uh, the sea would have been a little bit, think about the modern day Bahamas or the Florida Keys, take away the luxury yachts, and you've pretty much got what this part of the world looked like around about 330, uh, 340 million years ago. The Carboniferous Limestone. We see it also in places like uh, Kribath uh, in the upper Swansea Valley. Tilted here, though, at quite a steep angle. Um, and that's a result of another mountain building period, which I'll come on to in a minute. Uh, this, is a, this is a site which, I mean, it's a scheduled site, of course, for its industrial archaeology. Um, but it's uh, an absolute paradise for geologists as well. And Cardiff University send their students here to do their mapping practice. If we go into the later part of the Carboniferous period, we're still hanging around the equator. I mean, why wouldn't we? You know, what's not to like? Uh, again, the inset map shows us the rocks within Britain from the latter stages of the Carboniferous, so the Pennines particularly, but of course the South Wales coalfield and the North Crop, as it's called, the limestone belt that comes through from um, uh, Blynavon area in the east and then right through uh, across towards Carrick Kennan in the west through places like Llangattock and Kligakilai and so forth. And the sort of landscape that we're looking at, this is a shot uh, over the top end of the Swansea Valley uh, from Cribarth uh, over towards Penwicht. And what we're seeing here is a transition from the layered limestones from the early part of the Carboniferous uh, to, at top right, the layered grit stones. Uh, we used to call it the, the basal grit or the millstone grit series. We've given that name back to England and we have our own uh, name for it. And it's the, the Turch formation, T-W-R-C-H, after the river, part of the Maros group of rocks rather than the millstone grit series. And then at the boundary between the two, we've got diggings for rotten stone. Uh, trial diggings, I think, in this case, because I'm not sure they actually found any here, but they did uh, elsewhere. So within that picture, you've got two of the most uh, economically important rocks that have been worked within the what is now the National Park. The limestone, clearly that was... Uh, I mean, it's been used for aggregates, of course, for road building and construction purposes. It was particularly significant uh, as an input into the uh, metalworking industries, uh, as, a, as a flux uh, to remove impurities and so forth. Um, and uh, on smaller scales, of course, uh, burnt for the production of agricultural lime and indeed, uh, again, for, for construction. And then the, the, the Torch sandstone, the basal grit, at least the purer elements of it, as silica rock were crushed to make silica bricks to line the furnaces, refractory bricks. That happened at Dinas, it happened at Penwith, and it happened elsewhere. 
whilst we're in that uh, Maros series within the Toch Sandstone, we've got the Bishopston Mudstone as well, used to be known as the Middle Shale. We have some wonderfully poetic names like the 12-foot sandstone. Guess how thick that is? Not been metricated yet. Um, uh, produces some wonderful landscape features. In terms of rocks on journeys, all of these waterfalls, of course, are on journeys back up their valleys and little bits are dropping off. The cap rock here, the 12-foot sandstone, is dropping off uh, success successively and the rocks are falling into the pool, um, which doesn't make for a good landing for the people who try diving off here. At the end of the... Um, Carboniferous period, we had this second continental collision. It took place to the south of us, and it was, we know it as the Variscan orogeny. We were on the very northern fringe of it. We were on the southern fringe of the Caledonian orogeny, on the northern fringe of the Variscan. What that did was to reactivate some of the existing weaknesses in the Earth's crust, and two key ones go through our patch, or well, three arguably. The Carrickennan disturbance, which comes from Pembrokeshire, through Carrickennan wraps either side of the castle, in fact, and then continues up in an arc, a graceful arc, towards Shropshire and the Welsh border, or the English border. Uh, the Neath disturbance comes up from, the, from Swansea Bay, up the Vale of Neath, through this feature, Boer Mine, uh, next door to Dinas Rock at Pont Levechen, and then carries on towards Hereford, eventually, where it loses its identity. And then there's another one comes just past Brecon, and that is the Swansea Valley disturbance, and it comes through Cribbath. Uh, hence the tilted rocks of Cribworth that you saw a little bit earlier. So, so much for orogenies and plate tectonics. Let's quickly look at rivers and glacial action. Glaci well, rivers came first, glaciers came along, and now we're back to rivers. So, the landscape, essentially, of well, much of Britain, of course, was, was produced over the past 50 or 60 million years as we rose from... Uh, beneath the sea. Much of Britain was beneath the sea in all likelihood during parts of the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods. I've skipped those because there were no rocks of that age in this area. And as it rose, rivers began to erode into that landscape. And then in the last couple of million years, we've had a series of ice ages. Uh, they've finished, well, have they? Maybe they have, maybe we've done that. Uh, we're back into, into river action. But what the ice has left in many places, it, it's scooped out, it's eroded landforms, but it's also deposited things in the landscape. And there's a beautiful example here, a block of old red sandstone which has been transported by ice. This rock's been on a journey of perhaps only two or three kilometres from the north to end up here um, in the upper Swansea Valley. And elsewhere, other rocks have made similar journeys. This is on um, Kevin Cadlan. So this is a piece of the, uh, the Toch sandstone, which may not have been moved all that far at all. It's by far the largest of all of the uh, blocks on this particular piece of land. Um, fascinating area for its archaeology, uh, for, for, for not least for its Bronze Age archaeology, as, as many of you will know. And I've had the pleasure of doing walks here um, uh, with Edith Evans uh, from um, Glamorgan Gwent, uh, and indeed, uh, Michael Isaac, who is a zoologist and botanist. So we've had an archaeo, a geo, and a, a zoology botany input, which has been great. We've all come away from those walks, having learned something and, and shared our disciplines. Others don't stay where they're put. This is a, a smaller erratic on the common at uh, Menethlithid, near the mountain centre. This is a block of old red sandstone, but it's actually been displaced um, by parties unknown, um, somebody who's managing the land. National Park Authority owns the common. Uh, many graziers have interests in the common. Sadly, many rocks get moved uh, to the detriment of, uh, again, each of our ologies, you might argue, in terms of it being a wildlife habitat, in terms of some of these having uh, an historical or archaeological significance, and perhaps in terms of, let's say, looking at the distribution of glacial erratics, having a geological significance, which is rather lessened once it's been moved um, by, shall we say, anthropic means. Rivers are also eroding in the current day, and this is a, a, a bank of uh, glacial fluvial deposits next door to Craigenhorn Country Park on the Tower. Um, and the modern river is excavating these and producing, you know, a rather wonderful section through them. So it's a glimpse into the past. So these rocks 
that started their journey as old red sandstone in the southern hemisphere have moved north across the equator, courtesy of plate tectonics. They've moved upwards in the process as well, from near sea level um, to, let's say, what, five or 600 meters typically. Glaciers have then moved them down the valley to this spot at Kraganos, and now rivers are taking over that role and moving them a little bit further down towards Swansea Bay. Who knows where they'll end up next? Some have been pinched, meanwhile, for walling. Rivers are also taking our national park, the Old Red Sandstone, down to the sea. Um, the, the, the USC will be doing it today and certainly during the winter. The colour of it, a chocolate brown and Old Red Sandstone brown. Layers of sand and silt will be accumulating in the Bristol Channel, which may in time become uh, another layer of rocks, mudstones and sandstones, raised up high and eroded once again. So it's nature's grand recycling scheme over a 400 million year period. Uh, in this particular case. We're well, back to Scud Gladys. Why did I put that one in there then? I'm not sure. I'm just going to carry on. Okay. And I'm going to carry on to mass movement. So we're talking now about the effect of gravity on rocks, aided to a lesser extent, perhaps on occasion, by water uh, and other means. So we may find a scatter of rocks on a hillside, and it may not be obvious as to why they're there. And sometimes we're left scratching our heads. Was it human agency? Was it natural agency? If it was natural agency, what was nature doing? If it was human agency, who was it and why were they doing it? In this particular case, I think we're looking at nature, but we're looking at a mix of rocks. This is not far, far from uh, Wine Lakey on uh, Kevin Keel. Um, uh, we're looking at old red sandstone, but lots of different types. The, the block, which is a little bit shiny in the bottom left corner here, is a rippled uh, sandstone. Uh, again, sort of telling us a little bit about its origins within a, in fact, it was within a, a river setting, but there was a current flowing to give us the ripples. And it's quite thinly bedded. The blocks in the middle, you see my shadow of my hand there, are, are the more massive blocks, thicker, thicker units, not so well bedded. Uh, again, what you might call bog standard, old red sandstone. And then the two blocks over on the right, a little bit different again. They're actually covered in moss and lichen. And that's because these are, um, they are intraformational conglomerates with a calcareous matrix. Okay, so you'll remember that one. Intraformational, conglo a conglomerate is a pebbly rock. Intraformational means the pieces from which they are formed actually come from within the rock itself. So they were deposited, and then it was broken up by a subsequent flood and then redeposited. Calcareous matrix, it just means that it's got lime actually gluing the whole thing together as the cement. Go to mine clear, and you're looking at an intraformational conglomerate with a calcareous matrix. It's not bog standard old red sandstone. Let's look at major landslides in the park. For years it was thought of as a fantastic place to take children to look at glacial um, processes. It is, but it's not as simple as that. Um, what you've also had here are um, catastrophic landslides. And we think the, the last major landslide took place during the Ice Age. You had the, the main bit of the Ice Age, scooped it out in the usual way that uh, glaciers do. And then um, you had a landslip and then you had more glaciation actually reworking some of the uh, slipped material. This isn't just any old landslip, though. Uh, it's, um, it's what we call a Sturzstrom, a long run-out landslide. So it didn't just collapse down into the Kum, but it carried on all the way to the A470. The A470 wasn't there at the time. <laughs> but the bank above the A470, where the lay-by is, is the toe, the tip of this landslip. It's a long run out landslide. And at some point in the future, another bit of this is likely to go. Um, but it's, you know, there's no signs of movement in recent years. And it may take another ice age to do that, to re uh, destabilize once again the back wall. And then once the ice has melted, because it's buttressing it while it's there, once it's gone, we may have a, another movement of several million tons of rock. We can see where it's going to go. The Beacons Way goes along that, by the way. Don't all jump up and down at the same time, I think is the advice I would give. Uh, the Beacons Way also goes along the top of Van Dringarth, above Ustredvechter Reservoir. And um, 
from the very top of the mountain right down to the stream at the bottom where it enters the reservoir, there is a long uh, a land slip. And the inset here on the left shows some of the sort of uh, creased terrain, if you like. So there are gullies perhaps uh, up to 15 or 20 foot deep, make a marvellous shelter for having a coffee on a windy day uh, walk. Uh, and then it's all slumped down the material. Very difficult to date landslides, but we're talking post-glacial, probably early post-glacial. Much more recent, this only happened in the last decade, and this is one of the slips at the top end of the of Cumcreu, south of Penavan, uh, running into, and the stream itself runs into Beacons Reservoir. And it's the source of one of what Welsh Water call the, the red events, when the reservoirs turn, not red again, but brown, and clog up all the filters. And what they're keen to do is to stabilise some of these slopes, but they've been overgrazed. Uh, they're naturally unstable anyway because the slopes are still adjusting after the last ice age. So we're talking about lots of unconsolidated deposits wanting to consolidate themselves by moving down the hill. And it's going to continue, and it's, we're going to likely get more and more of it, of course, as the climate changes. Plenty more landslides over in the east of the park, but we're not talking about those today. Cultural reasons, one, archaeology. Well, look, I've already talked about mine here. Not much more to say there other than, you know, intraformational conglomerate, etc. Um, those guys knew what they were doing. They picked the right rock for the job. Now, as a humble geologist, I thought, well, where does this rock come from? You know, talking about rocks being on journeys. OK, clearly somebody upended it and put it into that hole that they'd pre-prepared. But before that, where did it come from? And if you look just up the hillside to the west, uh, up onto um, Van Neth, there are some rocks. And you think, well, maybe it came down from there. That would be the easiest place to get it from. But if you wander up there, only two or 300 metres away, you see old red sandstone, but quite a different type. And it's actually all folded. It's what we call a tectonite. It probably arose when the, the, the beds of sand had been laid down, partly become rock, and then were shifted, maybe by an earthquake, and then slumped into this fashion. It's not the same rock as, as mine here. But if we wander to the north by about uh, several hundred metres, to the lip looking down into Blind Seni, we find lots of rocks that look just like um, mine here. Now, you may tell me otherwise, but my immediate thought was maybe it came from here because all of its cousins, its siblings, are scattered across the landscape in that locality. Five minutes, right. Uh, mythology, right, I did mention mythology before, didn't I? What on earth, why on earth have I included this? Well, we all know that some rocks go on journeys of their own accord, don't we? We'll come back to Mine Clear because Mine Clear is known to go down to the stream to drink. Now, I'd never seen it do that, even after I'd been to the New Inn in Estradvesta and was wandering home, uh, having had a pint or two. Um, but a, f a few years ago, a um, former colleague of mine, uh, Natalie, uh, who was the National Parks archaeologist um, back in, what would it be, about 2012, 2014. We were asked by the BBC to meet up at uh, Mindclear to investigate the legend. So we did that. Uh, it wasn't quite Midsummer's Day, but close enough. And we waited for the sun to go down, and it began to creep closer to the ridge of Van Neve. And as it did so, the tongue-shaped rock, the tongue-shaped rock, the, the, the tongue-shaped shadow of the stone crept closer and closer to the stream. And at the very moment that the, um, the, the sun went down behind that ridge, that shadow touched the stream. Now, Hlia perhaps is a clue to it anyway, meaning, you know, the, 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 the suggestion is it's the licking stone. So this rock does go down to the stream to, to drink, but it's the shadow that does it rather than the rock itself. And uh, we can go to, into the east of the National Park and we come across uh, a big Alinig, the Lonely Shepherd. This rock goes for a walk uh, on Midsummer's Eve again um, because this is actually a lonely shepherd in human form who was turned to stone for being cruel to his wife. But uh, he's still lonely and now and again, well, once a year, uh, he's said to go down, uh, down into the clutter, I suppose it would be in this case. Locals used to paint the stone white so that if he did go wandering, they'd, be, they'd easily be able to spot him in the dark. Um, again, I've not seen that happen. It's probably a borrowed story because this rock pillar doesn't, presumably doesn't predate the quarries, which are 18th century limestone quarries, nor even 19th century. 
mineral exploitation quickly. Plenty of quarries, as we know, for, I've mentioned before about limestone and for sandstone, for building purposes. These are some of the quarries here on, on Cribarth, um, served by an extraordinary um, uh, network of, of, of tram roads taking the material down to the canal. And uh, also, well, adjacent to Krubarth, we've got here, it's a little bit difficult to pick out, but in the foreground is a linear trench, and this, these are workings for the rotten stone, uh, which is it's lodged between uh, the limestone and the, and the overlying sandstone. None left now, it was all worked out in the early 19th century, but nevertheless, the legacy is there in the landscape for all to see. Go to a place like Penwift, and you've got so much of that happening all at once, uh, quarrying of all of those different rock types. In the distance, you've got some of the glacial action. You've also got a uh, solution taking place of the limestone, so that uh, uh, dough lines, shake holes are forming, an awful lot of rocks on journeys in that area. Some fantastic glacial erratics too. And while you're there, remember that it was one of the key places where the refractory bricks uh, were made. The Dinas brick uh, made at Penwift and all stamped with the name. <coughs> Modern civil engineering, very quickly, indeed. Go back to the construction of the Brecon Bypass, uh, shifting earth around the place. We now live, arguably, within the Anthropocene epoch. We are at a position now where we move, humans move, more material around the Earth's surface than all of the world's rivers and glaciers combined. That, that, we crossed that threshold around about 20 years ago. So the Anthropocene is a, is a very valid term from that perspective. We are the principal agents, in some ways, of geological change. And we're continuing to do it. So 2019, I think it was, or was it, did it creep into 2020, the final uh, opening of the A465, the dual section of it through the Clodagh Gorge. And we've also moved a stone into position to commemorate that opening, um, the, the inset at top right there. And then finally, cultural reasons too, some stones are being moved around in the modern era, um, sometimes to the detriment of uh, stones that were moved in previous periods. And of course what we're looking at here is a hollowed out um, burial cairn up on top of Menachlanganada. Uh, of course antiquaries were uh, doing some of this work uh, in, in the past but it, 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 it has continued. I think one, one, one that I'm particularly aware of is the migration of one of the cairns on top of Blorenge. The uh, historic, prehistoric cairn is being moved to the site of a walker's cairn about four or five metres away. Um, so the, you know, the old is suffering at the hands of the new. Need a little bit of education there. And then almost finally, or finally, there's another one. That, this is another rock that's been on a journey. It's a granite could it be dolerite, pillar with a Maltese cross on the top surface of it, lying in the river, uh, the Usk, next door to Neville Hall. Um, this drowned monument, ironically, is a monument to um, a boy who drowned here about 100 years ago. Um, so that's come from who knows where, North Wales, Shap, granite quarries, etc. transported down here, erected on the side of the river. The river has moved it, put it down into, into the bed. Very low periods of flow. This is what you'll see, otherwise you don't see it at all. I hope it can be resurrected at some point and perhaps put on show. I've finished with that, although I think I'm probably a bit short of time. So thank you for listening, and I hope there's been something that sparked some interest there. Thank you. Thank you.